Hey, Stalker. Tired from a long journey, I assume? Why not sit here and rest by the campfire? Kick back for a bit, have something to eat, and share some stories with the guys. You've undoubtedly seen a lot in your wandering. Last October, me and five friends rent a cabin for the weekend in the middle of nowhere. Plan to alternate between being drunk and high the entire time. We're all stupid excited on Friday when we arrive. We all rode crammed together in one car. Get everything set up for a campfire in the woods and get wasted. Friend. Jay. Is getting over an ex. Crying like a beach. We all try to cheer him up. We all tell drunk stories. Near midnight, we are about a 10 minute hike away from the cabin. Which itself is a good 20 minute drive from a real road. We let the campfire go low and me and another friend. S are trying to get it started again while Jay is almost passed out behind me. Drunk blabbering. Jay goes quiet all of a sudden. Turn around and see Jay is standing beside a girl in a dress. No shoes. Remember, in the middle of the cold arse woods in October, Jay is staring at her. He gets out his phone and calls someone. Hangs up after a couple seconds. Girl is just looking at us while he does this. I ask her if she is lost. She moves her head side to side. Not a shake but like left ear to left shoulder then right ear to right shoulder. She keeps doing it. Jay is freaked out. Looks totally sober. S goes to Jay and she tries to calm him down. I ask the girl if she wanted to come back to the cabin with us. She says yes. Seems more normal now. The other two friends. K and M. Pack up our stuff and walk with strange girl while me. S. And Jay walk ahead. Jay says strange girl looks exactly like his ex. Thought it was her. He called his ex to see if she would pick up. She didnt. He is convinced it is her and she is ducking with him. I tell him the girl is probably some crazy religious guy as daughter or something that just runs around the woods for fun. Really, I thought she was homeless. Jay is kind of convinced and wants to go back and talk to her. He seems drunk again and it isnt hard to get him to go to bed instead. Me and S talk bulls eat till the rest get back. K and M get back. No strange girl. They said a strange girl would alternate between sounding perfectly normal, talking about being at school or working at some restaurant, then start doing strange gestures and waiting for us to respond. M asked her how she got in the woods and the girl said, Hey down. She started saying that to everything. M and K stopped talking to her. When they got close to the cabin, they looked around and she was about 50 feet behind them. They walked in without, guessing she was still out there. We all talk about how strange it is. Eventually we all go to sleep. I wake up. It's still dark. Jay is making a racket messing with the supplies. Look around and see strange girl standing to his side. Her dress is covered in dirt, scabs on her knees and arms. I get up and ask Jay what the duck. He says he heard a noise outside. Went to check it out. He didn't see anything but noticed the tires on the car were flat. Tells me he has some tire repair stuff in the supplies. What about her? I ask him. Strange girl was outside by the trees. He invited her back. I want to tell him he is a dumb duck and she probably popped the tires but she's right there so I just give him the stink eye. He finds the tire repair gel and a pump. I say I'll, I'll help him and we go outside. I tell him how strange the girl was to K and M. He blows it off and says she seems nice. You just miss your ex. You dumb duck. We get to the car and I see the two flats. And find a nail in each one. We start patching them. S comes out while we work. Says she woke up because a strange girl tried to sleep beside her. She probably saw K and M together and wanted to make a matching pair. Jay suggested. I think that s what it was though. Like she was trying to learn. She talks to us while we wait for the tire stuff to dry. She also thinks strange girl is homeless and we should make her leave. Jay vehemently denies. Says she'll make him not feel like a fifth wheel. 
You LL be worse than that when she slits your ducking throat. I wouldn't do that. Strange girl is at the door to the cabin. Overheard us, I guess. I apologize for talking about her. Say we were joking. And say she knows a joke. Why is the chicken dead? Why? Because it crossed the road. She makes a weird sound. Like a high-pitched snort then smiles at us. Her teeth are blinding my wife. She says she LL be back. Walk back into the woods. We all go in cabin. It is a wreck. Furniture slammed all over. K and M are gone. S says it was fine when she was in there 20 minutes ago. We look around the cabin. No sign of K and M. We cleaned up the cabin. But one of the chairs snapped in half. K and M come back. They are all scratched up and scared. They say that a strange girl started flipping out. So they ran out front and did not see anyone so they ran to the woods. They heard a weird sheet so they came back. There is no way they walked outside without us seeing them. There is only one door to the cabin. We all just sit there for a while, thinking that sheet out. Strange girl comes back sometime later. Covered in more dirt and maybe blood, she is dragging a dead deer. Neck ripped out. Casually, she says, I found you guys some food, lying in the woods. Jay asks her where she went. Hid the keys. Ask her if she means JS car keys. She says yes. Still casual. I ask her why. She says so we want to leave early. She wants us to stay. We all just stare. She drags the deer with her and goes towards a tree to gut it. I notice her foot got really ducked up. She is basically walking on her ankle. SNK and having panic attacks at this point. Screaming and crying. We try to calm them down. We sit in silence while strange girl strips the deer and cuts off strips from them. She waddles us back. Asks us to make a fire to cook the deer. I say okay and do it. Everyone else refuses to even talk to her. I make the fire and she cooks the deer by dangling the pieces in her hand over the fire. I say nothing. Very awkward. Her staring at me. Everyone behind me is whispering. Strange girl is singing while she cooks. It has a weird lullaby I know because my mom used to sing it. Scoop you up, shush you round, all the frowns go upside down. I try to smoothly step away from strange girl and towards the group. Jay says he has a spare key to the car and that we should get the tires on and leave. Strange girl is staring at us. I have a plan. But we all have to eat the deer. We all eat a strange girl deer strip. I have to hold back vomit thinking of her holding them like that. I tell strange girl how good they were. She smiles at me. It's too wide. I tell her we will need another deer for tomorrow. She smiles even wider. She says she LL go get some. She is walking more normally now. Still kind of a march instead of a walk. I sit there. Watching her walk away. As soon as she is out of sight. Everyone is running around. Tripping and dropping sheep. K and M pack up the trunk. While me. J and S inflate the tires and get them back on the car. By the time we are almost done. It's been about as long as she was gone last time. Weird smell in the air. Everyone is cramming in the car. Girls are crying whimpering again. Hear a THU bump when J pulls out. We were in such a hurry. We forgot to get the jack out from under the car. Jay runs back and gets it. Almost falls on his arse getting back in the car. He goes top speed for his sheet tie car. Dewey us and he slow down till we hit the actual road. We don't he talk about strange girl ever again except for once when we're drunk together. S says she still dreams about her. I had finally stopped thinking of all this until last week when I asked my mom where she got that lullaby from. She told me she made it up when I was a baby. Might as well tell my story. I was about 12 or 13, walking back from shopping center in England with my uncle around 45 years old at the time. Decided to take a shortcut and walk through the woods. It was a nice bright day, so why the duck not? We get the feeling that we're being watched and can hear brushes moving. I'm telling him something about this video game while he listens. Something in the bush repeats what I'm saying but extremely garbled. 
then I'm scared, but don't show. Start closing my eyes when we walk through bits that have bushes on both sides. It says it again, but much clearer. Greater than my uncle looks annoyed and says. Kids with nothing better to do. We hear it back perfectly, like it echoed. It repeats four or five times. We both think it's kids and decide to duck with them. Greater than uncle, he was kind of the naughty uncle. He'd let me swear around him which I wasn't supposed to do at my age and says. I'm a queer and I like blokes. The thing repeats it perfectly and says it a few times. We think it's hilarious and we're saying all sorts. We start to smell a rusty smell a bit like pennies. Wasn't too odd because the lake nearby had run off pollutants. Greater than zero sound at all. Birds have stopped. Wind stopped and so have crickets. Something starts to chase us and we get split off from one another. I can hear my uncle shouting my name so I start walking towards it. He's in a field clearing, looking around for me. Greater than go towards him. Glance back because I was always a paranoid boy. Greater than see uncle behind me. Anon stop. I'm really hungry. Look forward and see uncle again looking for me, look back. See a really stiff version of my uncle without much facial expression. Bolt straight off to the clearing and we both ran home. It fits the type of story that's usually posted here about skinwalkers. I have other uncles with experiences but they refuse to talk about it. Growing up as a kid my dad liked to take me out camping a lot. Oftentimes it would just be the two of us jumping into his truck, driving out into some remote area in the forest, not an actual camping ground, pitching a tent, and sitting by a fire. It was a great time for us to bond, away from the chaos of normal life, just the two of us hanging out with nothing else to do. Plenty of creepy stuff happened, but looking back at it now I can see that a majority of it was all my overactive imagination of being out in the woods in the middle of nowhere. Like the time we came across an area with a bunch of downed trees, and I concocted some story in my head about a monster that roamed the forest and took them all down. There was one moment though that's always stuck out, something about it never came off as being right, and I've never been able to fully explain or understand it. We were at a new camping area, some place we'd never been before, and after pitching our tent we decided to go walk off into the woods and wander around. After maybe about an hour in we broke through the trees and came across a clearing of grass. It was extremely odd in that all around was forest, and here was just this area of grass. In the middle of it sat a small cabin. It looked all raggedy and decrypt, like no one had been there in a very long time. All around the house besides the grass were old rusted out car parts, big huge pieces too. Which is really odd, because again you were literally surrounded by thick woods within this clearing, and it'd be extremely difficult, not to mention nonsensical to have all this junk, especially with no visible cars. Off to the side of the house was I guess a canyon, not really sure what to call it. Like a gap in between the land, which had a straight drop down, but the gap wasn't that big, maybe a foot or two, almost like someone purposely made this little gap here for some inexplicable reason. So, we walked into this area, before we did so it was pretty quiet with the exception of the occasional birds chirping or something. Yet as soon as we walked onto the grass we both distinctly heard this woman. She was yelling, pissed as all ducking sheet, but what she was yelling about I'll never know because it wasn't English. She had a typical Midwestern accent, that I remember, but whatever she was yelling was pure gibberish. Accompanied with her yelling sounded like pounding and banging of feet slash fist, and also slamming of pots around. What didn't make sense about this, is you could clearly see into the cabin with the window that faced us, and yet we couldn't really make out anyone inside, or at least I couldn't. What was even stranger was the smell, or really the lack thereof. See, the woods have a certain scent to them, at least I feel they do. It's refreshing, clean, woody, sometimes strong and pungent, but always a scent. There was nothing when we entered, nothing at all. Like almost a vacuum had sucked it all up and it was gone. So, after this woman had started screaming at us I obviously didn't want to be there anymore. I was more scared that we were on someone's land as opposed to something paranormal or weird going on. I looked up at my dad to tell him we should probably go, and that's when he did something I'd never seen him do before. He picked me up, and just ran straight into the woods. I'd never had my dad pick me up, and I'd never seen him run, ever. 
Maybe he saw something, maybe he understood something I didn't, I don't know, but whatever it was scared the sheet out of him. He ran for maybe a quarter of the way back to camp, set me down, and told me to just walk fast. The entire time we didn't say anything, and the entire time it seemed like he was about to do another dead sprint at any given moment. He kept looking back, expecting something, I don't know what. We got back to camp safely though, packed everything up, and immediately drove off. He's never talked to me about it, and every time I try to bring it up I just get silent. For the longest time I assumed it was just trespassing, but as I get older I find that harder to believe. Gather, round children, for tonight I'm going to share with you the single creepiest experience of my life. It happened many years ago when I was just a boy and to this day, I'm not really sure if it was paranormal or psychological and I've never really heard any satisfying explanations for it. My family moved to Florida in the mid-80s and took up residence in a large, ranch-style home in a suburb of Panama City. I had just turned seven and was acclimating myself to my new environment, having lived all of my life in northern Wisconsin. The house was a palette of warm browns, tans and late 70s stylings, surrounded by a beautiful yard with numerous trees and shrubs. In the late afternoons, the sunlight would filter through the greenery and make the house feel alive, earthy, and inviting. It didn't seem at all the place for something strange and terrifying. I remember the first time I saw him. I was sitting Indian style on the floor of my room, playing with my action figures after school. He man was leading another assault against the evil Transformer Armada, while my G.I. Joes lay hidden atop my bed waiting to act as the cavalry should the machine somehow gain a foothold in Eternia. As I grabbed my Ada to stomp down the masters of the universe, I felt a sudden pang of unexplained terror. It felt as if something was watching me from the doorway. Everything seemed to slow down and I could only barely move. With my heart pounding in my ears, I turned towards the door, staring back at me was an impossible thing. It looked like a child's drawing brought to life, entirely two-dimensional, like a sheet of paper cut to resemble the poorly drawn figure of a man in profile with a derby-style hat and a suitcase in one hand. It stood huge and white in the doorway and stared at me with its one empty eye. It wasn't even an eye. It was just a hole cut in the paper. I could see right through it, to the wall behind him. For unknown moments we stayed like that, staring at one another. Then he moved. He moved like a cartoon character. Instead of moving like a cut-out sheet of paper, his arms and legs would pass back into his body and then come out the opposite side. He seemed weightless and was impossibly fast as he suddenly darted across the doorway and ran into my parents' bedroom. I sat in stunned silence for several minutes. Then I started screaming. My mom came running in and tried to calm me down. My memory is in fragments after that. My mom said I was in hysterics for hours and at first she thought there was an intruder in the house. It was only when my dad came home from work that I was able to explain as best I could what I had seen. My dad had me draw him out on a piece of paper. Afterwards he remarked that it was odd I would draw a derby style hat, since I had never seen one before. My dad told me it was just a ghost and not to worry because ghosts can't hurt you. I don't think he believed it was a ghost at all, but I mostly accepted this explanation because I was a child and he was my dad, and dad knew everything. Nevertheless, I went to sleep that night with all the lights on. And every time the ceiling fan would blow a piece of construction paper in my room, I would sink further down underneath my covers and pray that I would live until morning. The very next day, the paper man returned. He followed me to school. I would see him while sitting in class, peering at me from the doorway. When I would look directly at him, he would run. He was waiting for me by the jungle gym at recess. Though he never came towards me, his presence was blatant and menacing. I had never been more afraid in my life. My teachers noticed I was acting strangely, but I didn't dare tell them. As I rode the bus home from school, he ran alongside it. No matter how fast the bus went, he was able to match its speed without effort. At each equal stop light, he just stood there, 
and stared at me with his empty eyes. All too soon, we were at my stop and I had to get off the bus. Alone. As the bus drove off I looked around desperately, but he was nowhere to be seen. I kept turning around as I made my way home, certain he was going to sneak up on me from behind. As I neared my house I ran for all I was worth towards it, somehow knowing he was right behind me. I got to the front door and threw it open. I turned around to slam it in his face, nothing. He wasn't there. After that, I only saw him sporadically. It was little comfort. Though weeks would pass before I would have another sighting, I always felt his presence. It was like he was toying with me. He had watched me long enough to gauge when I would turn around, and he would be gone before I could see him. Occasionally, I would glance a blur of white out of the corner of my eye. Just enough to confirm my fears. Weeks turned into months and months became years. We moved several times, once more in Florida and then finally to Texas. No matter how far we traveled, the paper man followed me. We were living in Alvin, Texas when I made the discovery. To this day, it still confounds me. It just doesn't make any sense. I had seen the paper man on and off in the new place. I had stopped talking to my parents about it. The sightings had been going on for almost 10 years at this point and I was now in my early teens. In desperation, they had made me see a psychologist who was no help at all. He said the man represented an unconscious fear of my parents getting a divorce. He was full of sweat. Even though I keep having sightings, I just kept them to myself. At this point the paper man was part of my life and I figured he would always be there, stalking me, waiting for me, just out of sight. Then one day when we were getting ready for a garage sale, my mom brought me several large boxes and asked to go through my old things and select what I wanted to get rid of. As I went through the old, beaten cardboard boxes, I was consumed with nostalgia. I had forgotten so many of my old toys. There was my old Fisher Price castle with the little trap door and the pink dragon. There was my old Kermit the Frog doll. There was my first dog's collar. As I dug deeper through my memories, at the very bottom of the box I came upon a stack of my old grade school readers. I remembered one in particular the moment I laid eyes on it. Seesaw. It was a thick, paperback book filled with short stories and poems to help young children learn to read. I sat down on the floor and started flipping through the pages. On page 12 was the little red hen, on 18th the painter and the dragon. I remembered these stories. It had been so long. I smiled and continued to read. As I leafed further through the thick, yellow book my warm feelings of nostalgia began to fade and that familiar creeping dread began to manifest itself once again. Page 38, Tiptoes. Page 40. Mike's Bike. Page 42. The Brown Bear's Hat. I sat on the floor and stared at page 45. To this day I still can't describe the emotions tearing through me at that point. I don't really know if there are such words in any language. Horror? Amazement? Disbelief? When faced with the impossible, the mind rebels and tries to make sense of things any way it can. But there was simply no way to make sense of what I was gaping at on page 45. It was impossible. It was the paper man. The phantasm that had stalked me for nearly a decade, stared up at me out of the page. A poor illustration in a children's second grade reader, there was no denying it or mistaking it. It was him. He stood in a crudely sketched doorway at the top of a staircase. In his hand was the suitcase and atop his head was the derby hat. In the middle of his featureless, flat face that single, empty eye stared back at me. And I could see right through it to the watercolor shading of the wall behind him. I don't know how long I sat there. I don't remember breathing. I don't remember anything except staring into that single empty eye. As I gaped at the illustration longer, burning every brush stroke into my soul, my eyes were gradually drawn to the door behind him and then to the staircase upon which he stood. I realized that underneath the drawing of the paper man, there were words. 
a few lines of staggered text, flowing diagonally across the page to parallel the lines of the staircase. For what must have been the first time since I was seven years old, I read those words once again. Yesterday, upon the stair, I saw the man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today, oh how I wish he'd go away. To this day I still have no explanation for the thing that tormented me for most of my childhood. None of the psychiatrists have ever been able to provide any sort of reasonable answer and despite years of me poring through books and case studies of the paranormal I have never once found a similar account. How the hell does an illustration come to life and haunt someone? It just doesn't make any damned sense. But I lived it. I lived through that nightmare. I survived. I never saw him again after that. Maybe it was because I had finally discovered the source of the phenomena and that the act of reading the poem and seeing the illustration once again finally jogged my repressed childhood memory and stopped the recurring hallucination. Maybe it was because I burned that goddamned book only moments later in my family's grill. Be me a month ago. Pheasant hunting season in the Dakotas? Take little cousin Brad who's 12 out to shoot some birds, walking downhill near woods. Anon over here. In the brush we find a pheasant that was seemingly torn to shreds not abnormal in a forest though. Continue on down the wooded stretch, early on walking little cousin starts saying he feels sick. End up having him head back to the car and decide to keep walking because it's a good spot usually. This normally great hunting spot is devoid of life complete silence. Get a whiff of an awful smell. I'm a hunter I know the smell of rotted animal. And this was like left in the dumpster on a 110 degree day rot. Very not normal for late November Midwest. Still dead silence starts slowly heading back to the car goosebumps and my guts putting me in fight. Or flight mode. Almost running back up the small hill towards the car. Behind me back in the thicket suddenly I hear the first sound that wasn't me since I started. Just a small twig snap, ready my 12 gauge at the area completely terrified. Stench of rod is double. Anon over here. Cousin Brad's exact kind of sick tone from earlier. No sign of him near me. Scream some threats and curses that if it's him he needs to step out. Still like 5 minute jog from car. Say fuck it and let off two shots at a sketchy looking tree and snowy log. Something pale white goes wild from behind the log making hyena sounds kicking up snow running away down the hill at deer speeds. It blends with the snow like a humanoid blur. Sprint back to car as fast as I can. Cousin Brad's playing Clash of Clans on his phone eating jerky normal. Question him while speeding away he says he never left the car. Didn't hunt the rest of the season. Camping with family on a rather secluded beach near San Quentin in Ensenada. There's this dormant volcano nearby. Dad suggests we should check out the crater. Being as adventurous as him I agree to tag along. Hop on his old jeep and get on a road we believe leads up the volcano. It's mid-November so by 5 or 6 in the afternoon it was already getting dark. Been driving about an hour and not really seeing the peak getting closer. Getting bummed. Instead the road is getting narrower. Getting worried. It's already around 7.30 and it's already pitch dark. Worse is, we finally find the end of the road. Only rocks and mostly bushes around. At least the road with the clear vehicle tracks, ahead the path is fairly flat and it seems to go up. Feel of adventure and common sense are conflicting. We stop to discuss the predicament we're in at the moment. Suddenly something breaks the monotony of the trip. Something rises up from among the bushes to our right. A single red glowing eye slash orb comes up as if startled by the car's engine. Me and my dad are silent, trying to figure out what sort of wildlife we stumbled upon. Options narrow when I realize the size of this thing, or rather its height. From my seat I could see it almost at eye level so maybe 1.50m or like 5 foot. Still silent, things still staring at us. Suddenly. It moves closer, as if it took a step forward. My dad shifts gears to reverse sensing this thing might actually not be wildlife. The noise of the shifting gears seems to startle the creature. And so it makes its exit. Mother Ducker starts bouncing. Silently and floaty as if the thing was made of paper. 
still looking at us. Every bounce going higher until on its last one it flies off out of sight. Needless to say we book it back to camp. To this day I'm not sure what we saw. B-17 at my house, about 9 p.m., in a rural suburb. Forget my homework is in my Jeep in the driveway. Go outside to retrieve homework. My rear door is locked from the inside so I unlock the passenger side front door and lean over the middle console to the back seat. Searching for homework when I feel like someone is watching me. Looks directly left at the rear passenger window. I see a pure white face with black holes for eyes and a mouth like those Mardi Gras masks. As I stare I realize there is no body attached. It lunges at the window. GTFO. I jump out of my jeep and immediately look under my jeep and to the side of my house. Realize it wasn't someone ducking with me. Ran inside and accused my dad of ducking with me, but he wasn't. He then told me a similar story that happened to my uncle. Haven't seen it since. Be me. Maybe 12 to 13 years old. We live in a two-story house, dad, mom, lil bro, and I sleep on the first floor, and my uncle on the second floor. One day watching TV at around 4 p.m. Mom asks me to go for some clothes upstairs. Go upstairs. Walk past my uncle's room. After I go past the door someone says, what are you doing here? This is my room. Realize I saw someone lying in uncle's bed. Male, curly short hair, green tea, jeans, and socks. This was not my uncle, he was working. Didn't think much of it. Get the clothes. End of my spooky part. Same day, at night. Be 32 years old uncle. Sleeping in my room on second floor of Anon's house. Get very cold all of a sudden. Get blanket and cover all the way to my head. Later that night. Awoken by something pressuring over my chest. Can't see nothing. Blanket blind. Can't move. It's so heavy. Hear growling. Like very deep growling. Sounds like a lion. Try to touch the thing that's sitting on me. It runs, but I get to catch its tail. Pull blanket of my face. Lion is no longer there. Same night, probably same exact time. Be 16 years old next door neighbor. Be sleeping in my room. Everything dark, all family sleeping. Hear someone moving chairs, we had heavy wooden chairs, and it heard like they were being. Tossed around like nothing. Hear glasses and dishes shattering. Hear something hitting the walls, like closed fist bumping on the walls in rhythmic fashion. All my family and I go outside of our rooms to check. Everything is okay, no chairs moved, no dishes broke. Same night, same time. Be 27 years old front door junkie neighbor. Awake at 2.30 to 3 a.m. smoking weed at my room. Hear a loud bang several times. Decide to go check it out. Go to balcony and watch across the street. See big black purplish orb, like spheric smoke, bouncing on 16 years old next door neighbor's house. Be very spooked. Start crying. Sleep with my mom. All these happened on the same night. We never had any explanation for it, some people said. It was probably a witch or something. I'm very sure that other strange stuff happened the same night all across my street because I did saw a lot of neighbors coming together to talk about something. Some old lady came to our house to pour holy water and bless it. Nothing creepy happened ever again. <laughs>